So welcome everyone to the second Maryland Thesis Showcase. We kicked this off last year as kind of a new concept in Maryland, but certainly not, um, certainly not a new concept. So the 3MT was started in Queensland, Australia, and has grown. And we have an Australian native here to, to correct me if I've gone wrong, and has just grown and grown into this international competition that it is today. And here, we're doing this on a Maryland scale, and we have representatives from Johns Hopkins University, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, University of Maryland College Park, University of Maryland Baltimore County, and my home campus, University of Maryland Baltimore. So welcome to UMB. We are pleased to host this for the second year and look forward to all your presentations. Um, first, I'd like to recognize the judges that we have and thank them for their time. We have Dean Patricia Davidson from Johns Hopkins School of Nursing, Laura Kozak, Associate Vice President, Office of Communications and Public Affairs from UMB, David Cohn, Director of Medical and Science Media Relations from the School of Medicine here at UMB, and Roger Ward, Vice President of Operations and Planning, Vice Dean of the Graduate School. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, they're going to be judging each of you. We're going to be collecting the score sheets after each presentation to keep everything rolling, and we'll be calculating some scores in the back so that you, as you walk out, you'll know who the winner was from today's competition. So I wish you all the best of luck with that. Um, just a few other notes. Uh, we, have, we are recording this event, so if you could speak from the podium, that will be the best way to capture both your voice, the slides, and um, have this available for others to view. Um, if you, and we also plan to put names with your title slides, so if that's a problem for any of you, if you don't want that publicized, please let me know um, before you leave here today. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to have the winners by the end of the competition, but the checks will be mailed later. Um, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, we have, a, if everyone grabbed a pro program, we're just going to go in the order that's on the program. And so we're going to kick things <coughs> off with, and we're going to be keeping time in the back. So we'll give you your warning in the back. Um, Kelly DePriest from Johns Hopkins University. You can go ahead and flip the slide when you're ready. Okay. Do you want me to wait? Wait till I get in the back. Okay, fair, fair. If everyone could please join me and take a deep breath in and let it out. In the United States, over 2 million children have uncontrolled asthma. So for them, that simple act of breathing in and breathing out can be a complicated process. Children with uncontrolled asthma have frequent asthma attacks during the day and night and spend more time in the emergency department and hospital than most other children. Uncontrolled asthma is also more common for children living in poverty and racial and ethnic minorities. In the United States, for example, African-American children are nearly eight times more likely to die from asthma, eight times than non-Hispanic white children. Did you know that one potential way to improve asthma for these children is by adding green space, such as urban gardens, to their neighborhoods? If you would, take a minute and close your eyes and picture yourself in the middle of your favorite park, forest, or field. Once you're there, slowly inhale through your nose to savor the scent of the lush vegetation. Please open your eyes. The feeling you have now, that overwhelming sense of calm, that is the power of green space. Research has confirmed that green space decreases stress and decreases air pollution by filtering the air. For children growing up in poverty, they can grow up in neighborhoods with high amounts of neighborhood stress and high amounts of outdoor air pollution as well as high amounts of asthma triggers within their homes, such as cockroaches, mice, and secondhand smoke. And for certain families who are renting apartments or have unstable housing, these factors can be very difficult to change, and they all lead to uncontrolled asthma. Green space is a perfect solution. Not only does it decrease stress and decrease air pollution, it also provides children with a place to play outside, <coughs> thereby limiting some of the exposure in their homes to these asthma triggers. Thus far, Research investigating the links between neighborhood green space and asthma control has had mixed results. My hypothesis is this is because researchers have failed to account for other neighborhood factors that might affect children growing up in poverty, such as neighborhood safety. Just think about it. Parents of children living in unsafe neighborhoods are more likely to keep their children indoors, thereby increasing their exposure to cockroaches, mice, and secondhand smoke, and limiting the potential benefits of neighborhood green space. 
Along these lines, my dissertation research will investigate the associations between neighborhood green space, neighborhood safety, and asthma control for children living in Baltimore City. The results of this research will inform programs that add green space to neighborhoods. Through this work, I'm confident that we can profoundly and directly impact the health of children with asthma. Rather than just imagining green space, we should all be able to experience it firsthand. My dissertation research is the next step to making that a reality. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Isis Jemiotin Amaye from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Imagine jolts of electricity being pushed into your brain. Not the best feeling, right? Okay, now imagine that feeling while you're driving to work or to school. Next thing you know, there's an accident. As a parent, imagine your little girl or your little boy in a playground. They're playing with their friends. Next thing you know, that seizure happens. Danger. You see, that fear, that's what epilepsy patients, they live with every day. And it can affect anybody, young or old, big or small, boy or girl, it doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, statistics show that one in every 26 Americans would develop this disease in their lifetime. And currently, there are over 3 million people in the U.S. alone living with that disease. And in the world, there's 60 million people living with epilepsy. So it kind of affects their way of life. And typically, medications will help to control this disease and control the seizures so that it can have a better way of life. But in the case of drug-resistant epilepsy, the medications don't work. So the patients, they have to live with epilepsy seizures con consistently all through their lives. So my PhD research is a fight against drug-resistant epilepsy. What I'm doing is I'm using a chemical model called molecular hybridization, where I take two different chemical parts that work from a drug and bring them together to make one hybrid compound, one drug that will work better than just giving the patients two different drugs. So Using the um, key and lock picture I have on my slide, imagine me as a key maker. So what I'm doing is I'm taking two different keys and I have these locks that work. We just need the key to open them, right? So what I'm doing is I'm making the keys by taking two different keys, bringing them together to, wait, to make one perfect key. That one perfect key will open multiple locks. And the process of doing this, I'll be able to treat multiple patients that have multiple receptors because that's how epilepsy works. There are multiple receptors. So if I have one key that can open multiple locks, then I can help these patients that are drug resistant bring their seizures under control. So to answer my research question that in the fight against drug resistant epilepsy, I say between us and epilepsy, we can can, and through our hard work, we will. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jarrett Smith from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Okay, so let's say I give you a glass of water, and then I give you a red dye and a green dye. And then I bet you that you can't add both the red dye and the green dye into that glass without the colors mixing. And then you say, Jarrett, why would I ever want to do that? And then I say, but I bet you can't. So you think about it, and you know you can't just take the red dye and the green dye and add them into the water because then they'll mix and you'll get some third color. But you're very clever. So you take the red dye, you add it to the water, and it turns red. But then you take the green dye and you add it to oil. Then you take the green oil and you drop it into that red water, and now you have green oil droplets inside of red water. And now the colors stay separate. And that means now you win. So. Our cells face a very similar problem, and that's because we're all complex organisms, and that means we have all these different kinds of cells. Neurons, muscle cells, sperm, egg cells. But to get all those different kinds of cells, that means some of our cells have to be able to split into two different kinds of cells. An A-type cell that will go on to turn into one set of cells, and then a B-type cell that will go on to turn into some different set of cells. So, that also means that when this cell divides, or before it divides, it has to move all of its A-type stuff to one side of the cell and keep all of its B-type stuff on the other side of the cell. And it has to stop them from mixing. Now, the way the cell does this is actually very similar to our trick with the oil and water. The problem for the cell, though, is that 
it has to go from all of these things already being mixed to them being separate. And that means that some things inside the cell have to change from being like water to being like oil. So how do you do that? What I've discovered is that there's a special protein called MEG3. And that MEG3 is special because it can change from being like water to being like oil. What I've also discovered is that when MEG3 does this, it can grab other things in the cell and pull them in to those oil droplets with it. What that means is that now the cell can separate all of its A-type stuff to one side and then keep all of its B-type stuff on the other side and it can stop them from mixing. What that means is that MEG3 is the answer to this really long-standing and fundamental question in biology. Because this process of a cell dividing asymmetrically is fundamental to all of complex life. Because when you lose this, most organisms are not even born. When you lose this, a lot of different, all those different cell types that you have, you don't have them anymore. Neurons, muscle cells, blood cells, sperm, those are all gone. When you lose this, most cells can form all these different kinds of cancer because when you lose this, what you're left with is the same kind of cell dividing into the same kind of cell over and over and over again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janae Baptiste from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Janae? Nothing makes us appreciate the power of medicine more than getting sick or seeing a loved one get sick. And while there have been several medical advancements made, challenges such as drug resistance and intolerance really highlight the need for the development of new therapies. Once that new drug is discovered and optimized, it's tested in animals before clinical trials in humans. But consider the situation if there's no good animal model. There might be a great drug that's been discovered, but it wouldn't get to patients in need. This is actually one of the factors that's hindered the development of therapies against the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. But cats may be able to help us overcome this hurdle because they have their own version of HIV called the feline immunodeficiency virus, or FIV. In addition to being similar to HIV in terms of virus replication, um, FIV has an um, assembly process that involves a matrix protein shown in green binding to the plasma membrane and triggering the budding of new virus particles that can then go on to infect other T cells. This is a process that occurs in roughly 10% of cats in the United States alone. So there's several opportunities to use these cats that are infected as an animal model in the laboratory. I'm particularly interested in solving the matrix protein structure because the structure for HIV has, not be, has been solved, but the FIV matrix protein structure is not known. And by knowing the structure of the protein, we know what our target looks like and drugs against this target can be developed. The way that I'm aiming to solve this protein structure is by a technique called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or NMR. And this is an approach that will allow me to detect the chemical environment of this matrix protein and provide a spectrum, such as the one shown here, that serves as a fingerprint of the matrix protein. Now I'm able to use this data to calculate a three-dimensional structure, such as the ribbon diagram, above and this allows me to compare to that of HIV matrix and helps us move toward development of HIV therapies. Thank you. Our next speaker is He Jong Hong from Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing. Okay, did you know some tuberculosis drugs not only save people's lives but also cause permanent hearing loss? Tuberculosis or TB is number one infectious disease killing a lot of people globally. Especially, the advanced form of TB infection caused by bacteria resistant to classical TB drugs is a now global health emergency. To treat this form of TB infection, aminoglucoside injection, in short, drug A, is widely used. Unfortunately, one of the side effects from this drug is permanent hearing loss. So one in four patients are losing some level of hearing during the treatment and finally leaving a disability. This last toxic oral drug B, named bedaclin, is a substitute for drug A. However, a lot of clinicians have very hard time to decide which drug they should start, especially in resource-limited countries like South Africa, because drug B is four times more expensive. It is available only for patients who have high risk for developing hearing loss. 
But the risk evaluation is solely based on the clinician's expertise without a testing measure to support their decisions. In reality, TB hospitals in South Africa use drug aid to all patients at first. If a patient develops hearing, lo hearing loss, then they change to drug B. But by the time hearing loss is detected, it is too late because the damage is irreversible. Now, imagine, what if we can predict who will develop a hearing loss from drug A treatment? Then we can start B to patients who are at the highest risk by priority, right? So I'm developing a hearing loss prediction model based on the patient's risk factors before TB treatment. To develop this model, existing clinical data would be used such as age, gender, HIV, or nutrition status, etc. The final model would be a mathematical formula, so clinicians can use this formula to calculate the probability of hearing loss before prescribing TB drugs. Let me give you an example. Okay, he has a TB, and he got 80% from the model. So for this high-risk patient, we can start drug B to save his hearing. Amazing. So if treatment-related hearing loss is predictable, then it can be prevented. So we can treat TB, reduce disability, finally improve their quality of life. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Johnson from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. So if anyone were to think back to any sort of skill that you've learned over your lifetime that took many uh, days and many uh, hard hours of work, whether it be learning a new language, uh, learning to ride a bike, uh, or maybe learning to play golf. Uh, what all of those take uh, are many hours of repetition over many sessions. And the hope is that at each session, when, as you practice that given skill, uh, your skill will improve and will be retained over time. Uh, and this is the case for, um, like I said, many different tasks, whether you're learning a new language, learning to golf, uh, learning to throw a ball with your non-dominant hand, uh, or relearning how to walk again and move your arm again after you've sustained a, a stroke or a brain injury. Now, the time period in between those practice sessions, those practice sessions we can call encoding and retrieval of the memory that you've been uh, repeating, whether it be motor or cognitive, that period in between those two sessions is when the brain is consolidating what you've learned so that you can pick up where you left off at the previous session. Now, um, patients in the hospital oftentimes uh, don't have enough time in the hospital to have the sessions that are fully needed to fully regain motor function. And in the current healthcare climate, it's very unlikely that their time in the hospital will be extended for rehabilitation. So what I'm interested in is perhaps instead of trying to increase the number of uh, rehabilitation sessions, perhaps what we can do is en enhance that consolidation process. Um, so the time in between their therapy sessions is actually uh, um, related to their carryover and retention of the skills that they're learning uh, in rehabilitation. Now, what someone does during that time period can actually influence their uh, their skill level and their retention. So let's say if someone is learning to throw a ball with their left hand and then immediately go and uh, read their, their second uh, French book or Spanish book um, or go learn to play golf for the first time. Uh, it's been shown that that can actually impair the consolidation process of that first skill they were being practiced with. And as such, the retrieval of that throwing skill later on will be decreased as relative to someone who sleeps during that time period. So what you can see in a sleeping brain is there are spontaneous reactivations of the same neural circuits uh, involved with the actual throwing activity. Um, so it's almost as if the brain is rethinking about doing the throw. Uh, not that it's actually dreaming about it, but the uh, so, sort of the implicit circuits are doing this. And my, uh, my research is focused on enhancing this process. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carrie Lee Fang from the University of Maryland College Park. You are the parent of a baby. To become a successful adult, a baby needs support and nurturing. It needs the best environment you can offer to learn and grow. My research does not focus on human babies, 
but on baby firms. I use this term, baby firms, to refer to firms within the first year of their birth. They are leading innovators, major job creators, and pioneers of economic development. A city, region, or nation relying too heavily on mature firms, but having very few baby firms, would suffer from stagnant development. But there is a problem. Our baby firms are withering in tough competition. In Maryland, baby firms are five times more likely to fail than mature firms with otherwise identical characteristics. This happens because when it comes to baby firm, we suddenly unlearn everything we know about successful child raising. We let baby firms sustain the market competition from the very first day of their birth, expecting them to compete against mature firms. We simply sit back and rely on the market to select the winners and weed out the losers. Markets work perfectly in theory, but they break in reality because new firms have many disadvantages, inexperience, lack of funds and financial channels, and lack of loyal customers. These baby firms need support and nurturing. Leaving them unsupported in the market is like raising a six-year-old against college students. And as my research shows, this is not only unfair, but also costly. My research quantified this cost so that we can design policies to care for baby firms. Using the data of all firms in Maryland 2004 to 13, I found that baby firms are incredibly fast learners. They grow 10 times faster than mature firms and could outperform mature firms in just three to five years. But a third of them never had a chance. They were wiped out of the market before they become strong enough to sustain the competition. I further compare two identical baby firms. Both were on the margin of bankruptcy. One went bankrupt and the other survived by chance. If minor support, such as an extra load of funds, could have been provided in time, that bankrupt baby firm could have survived and become similarly successful. Failure to support these promising baby firms cost us half a billion dollars in lost revenue and 3,000 job positions every year in Maryland. So let's be good parents and protect baby firms from market competition with funds, trainings, and access to investors and consumers. If we do that, they grow up to be successful adult firms and bring economic vibrancy to our community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joseph Shin from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Joseph. I'd like to tell you about something that excites me every morning, something that I'm very passionate about. Imagine that you are a 20 to 30 year old individual. You're perfectly healthy and it's the prime time of your life. But one day, you notice that the skin on your fingertips and your toes are no longer soft, but they're stiff as plastic. And the stiffening of your skin begins to spread up your arms, to your face, to your torso. And within a few years, it spreads into your heart and your lungs, so that even breathing becomes the most difficult thing you can do at your young age. This is the reality for our patients with scleroderma. Scleroderma is an aggressive disease that predominantly affects young women. And we don't have a cure because well, we just don't understand the disease. You see, for many other conditions, we've identified a specific change in the DNA as the cause of that disease. But despite numerous genetic screens using the best technology available, we still don't know what causes scleroderma. Their DNA sequence essentially looks normal. So what's causing scleroderma? How can we fix it? To address these two questions, I took skin biopsies from healthy individuals or scleroderma patients at Johns Hopkins. And I found that scleroderma cells produce a ton of proteins that cause skin stiffening. But isn't that odd? Why are scleroderma cells behaving so abnormally if their DNA sequences are essentially normal? What are we missing here? What we often neglect is that the DNA is not simply a linear string of sequences like the lower box here. Rather, they're tightly wound up to form a complex three-dimensional structure as the box above. And the shape of the structure can have a profound effect on how cells behave. So we went back and we performed a new type of DNA sequencing called attack sequencing. And we found that the shape of the DNA in scleroderma cells were profoundly different. And we demonstrated that this altered shape allows uncontrolled production of proteins that cause skin stiffening. So it's an exciting time. It's exciting because we one finally found a foothold into understanding the biology of scleroderma. 
It's exciting because we've advanced new generic drugs, actually, that can normalize the shape of the DNA and normalize the behavior of these cells. It's exciting because we've advanced a new perspective in understanding human pathology. What other diseases can we now explain knowing that the shape of the DNA can wreak havoc in the cell? This is what I'm passionate about. Thank you. Our next speaker is Denise Williams from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Society is showing an increased desire for high definition technology or technology that offers us an improved color resolution experience. Now there are several different ways that manufacturers have come up with in order to match this desire, but specifically the developers of the Amazon Kindle Fire HD X7 and the Samsung QLED TV have been incorporating a new technology into their devices in order to achieve this resolution. That, that particle is known as a quantum dot, and the quantum dot is a semiconductor nanoparticle on the order of 2 to 10 nanometers in size that can be of a core or a core shell structure, depending on the device that it is going into or simply the preferences of that manufacturer. Now, the reason the quantum dot is able to improve the color resolution of our devices is because it can be tuned to show all the different colors of the visible spectrum by simply changing its size. So, if you want a quantum dot to show a color on the order of blue, you would grow it small. But if you want it to shift its color to the red, you would grow it larger. Now, the quantum dots that you would typically find in the technologies I mentioned before and for several other applications are made up of cadmium and lead-containing semiconductors. Now, this is concerning because of the known interactions that cadmium and lead have with humans and with other organisms inside of our environment. Now, we're not particularly concerned with using the technologies ourselves, but what is concerning is when we are done with these technologies and they are building in our landfills and they can degrade to their elements and come into contact with organisms. So my studies are looking at modeling the interactions that quantum dot technologies may have with environmental organisms, starting with a bacteria known as Schuonella onidinesis. Preliminary studies with this bacteria have shown that the cadmium selenide containing quantum dots severely decrease the ability of these bacteria to grow, whereas a potential alternative, the zinc selenide quantum dot, does not have an impact on the livelihood of these bacteria. This shows the need to continue continue modeling the studies that these technologies may have on our environment and potentially on human health. In addition to also to understanding the interactions that these technologies may have, it is also a push to try and develop alternatives such as the zinc selenide quantum dot so that it can also be used in these technologies, meaning that we have to shift this emission from just its natural UV and blue emitting light to cover the same spectrum that the cadmium and lead containing quantum dots do. So the aim of my project is to model these interactions and also under try to figure out if we can develop alternatives that can be non-toxic to our environment but still allow us that improved high definition technology. Our next speaker is Sarah Hirsch from the University of Maryland College Park. When we buy our food at the grocery store, we look at the price tag, but we don't usually think about the cost that growing food has on the environment. What if we could grow food that had less environmental impacts while at the same time saving farmers money. Crops need nutrients to grow and be productive. That's why we apply fertilizer. They need more nitrogen than any other nutrient. Nitrogen readily moves through the soil. That means it's accessible to the growing crops, but it also can leach downward and enter the groundwater and out into bodies of water. In estuaries such as the Chesapeake Bay, nitrogen inputs can cause serious problems such as massive die-offs of shellfish or buildups of toxic algae that can be harmful to human health. Corn and soybean agriculture tend to leak nitrogen. First, they're only growing for four months out of the year. And second, corn only uses about half of the nitrogen fertilizer that's applied to it. So the first question I asked is how much nitrogen is left in the soil after growing a corn or soybean crop? To find out, I took deep soil cores on 25 farms across Maryland and Pennsylvania. I found huge pools of nitrogen. The amount of nitrogen that I found was two times the amount that a farmer would typically apply to a corn crop. If farmers could capture and recycle this pool of nitrogen, they could save big on fertilizer costs and at the same time prevent this nitrogen from entering bodies of water. 
So I began investigating how to use a deep-rooted crop that's planted in the fall to capture and recycle this pool of nitrogen. First, I buried a nitrogen isotope tracer, basically a way to track how nitrogen moves from the soil into plants. Next, I planted radish and rye. I found that if I planted the radish and rye by early September, they would quickly grow deep roots and capture nitrogen from six feet deep by December. But early planting was key. If I planted them in October, they would only capture nitrogen from two feet deep. Next, I took this practice to the farmers. Over 20 farmers volunteered to plant trials of radish and rye, and they had similar results that if planted early, they were picking up deep soil nitrogen. Furthermore, the radish would die over the winter and decompose. It would release its nitrogen on the soil surface. Now the nitrogen's at the right place and at the right time to be used by the following summer crop. This is a straightforward practice, essentially letting plants do what they're good at. Plants scavenge leftover nitrogen, and this prevents it from entering bodies of water. Next, the plants die and release this nitrogen on the soil surface, providing a free fertilizer. We end up with a win-win situation for crop production and clean water. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amanda Labuza from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. We've all been told that calcium is important for our health. Growing up, we were told to drink lots of milk to help our bones be nice and strong. But were you aware that calcium is involved in more than just your bones? When our muscles contract and we try and lift something, calcium is flooded into those cells. And in order for us to relax those muscles, it needs to be cleared away. Similarly, in our brain, if calcium is in the cell, it turns it on and has to be cleared away to turn neurons off. If calcium is misregulated, whether there's too much or too little, and depending on which cell types this occurs in, we can get a wide variety of diseases, ranging from diabetes to neurodegenerative diseases such as Huntington's or Alzheimer's to muscular dystrophies. Therefore, it's very important for us to be able to understand how calcium is regulated in the cell. When the cell's working properly, calcium enters the cell from the outside into the cytoplasm, the main compartment of the cell, and from a specialized compartment called the SR, shown as the light blue box in the top left corner. When calcium is then finished, it needs to be taken up back into the SR through a protein called Circa. I like to focus on Circa's activity. So if we zoom in on Circa, shown as the purple protein, we can see that it's regulated by two other proteins. The first is sarcolipin, labeled as SLN in the orange. This is a known inhibitor of Circa. It stops Circa from clearing that calcium away and keeping it at a high level. We recently showed that small anchorin 1, the red protein, can also have the same effect in muscles. It can stop Circa's activity at certain points in time. My thesis focuses on two main questions about small anchorin and Circa. The first is how is small anchorin interacting with Circa? Is it through the whole protein, through a specialized domain, or is it through even just a single amino acid? By being able to understand how these two proteins interact, we can understand how things are working when they're working correctly or when things are going wrong. The second question is, can we apply what we know in muscles to neurons? We know small anchorins interacting with circa in muscles, but does that mean it's also interacting in neurons? Can we translate this information to help us with neurodegenerative diseases such as Huntington's disease? By being able to understand how calcium is regulated, we can understand diseases, we can help make diagnostic tools, and potentially make treatments for some of these problems. It's important for us to be able to understand things on a small molecular level so that we can start to solve large-scale problems. Thank you. That concludes the presentation portion. I would like to ask all the presenters to gather in the front so I can get a picture while the judges are tallying scores and welcome everyone to have some refreshments while we um, get those final numbers together. And again, congratulations for winning your competitions at your schools. I was just telling Dr. Tall, everyone's already a winner. So this is just icing on the cake, right? Um, 
And thank you again for coming out today and driving here from your home institutions as far away as the Eastern Shore and, uh, and joining us here in Baltimore. So without further ado, I have three awards to give to our top presenters. And can we have drum roll? No. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Third place for the Maryland Feast of Showcase is Carrie Lee Fang. <laughs> All right, and second place, and Ki Jong Hong. <laughs> and first place, Joseph Shin from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. All right, if we could have those awardees come up and we'll get your picture together and 